the last few weeks, as we've been in this sermon series, week one, we talked about how God wants to have a relationship with us. God created us for relationship. He, wants, uh, he sent Jesus to restore us back to relationship. And sin was what broke that relationship and caused the barrier between us. Jesus paid a price for sin so that we could be restored back to it. And in relationship, there is always good communication. So we talked about that in week one. In week two, we talked about everyone can hear God because of the coming of the Holy Spirit and the outpouring of the Spirit. There were people in the past in the Old Testament, prophets, priests, and kings were the only ones that could hear God and speak for Him. And we learned in week two that, that in the day of Pentecost, when the church was birthed, the Holy Spirit was poured out on all mankind. And as a result, young and old and men and women and really common everybody's that have the Holy Spirit are able to hear Him. And that was just tremendous. That's pretty awesome. The new address of God is, is the people of God. Those that place their faith in Jesus now have the Holy Spirit living inside them, which was God's intended goal from the beginning. And so that was what we studied in chapter 2. And then chapter 3 was last week. And if you're in the mornings, Pastor Don shared, and in the evenings I shared about how hearing God and the Scriptures work together. The Bible is the timeless, unique voice of God that's the foundation for everything God will ever say to us in our life. It has a unique voice. It is separate unto itself. It is the Word of God for all people, for all generations, for all time. It does not change. It is what God wanted us to have, and it is what God wanted us to know. But in the, in, within the parameters of Scripture, we also believe the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us guides us into all truth, helps us understand how to apply the Bible, helps us understand, uh, gives us discernment, and, and walks us through situations and circumstances where we need Him to say things that we need to hear in moments and in circumstances. And as we draw close to the Lord in our prayer time and in our, in our life with Him and walking with Him, He speaks to our heart, and we need Him to do that, particularly as we love and minister to other people in a broken, lost and dying world. We really need the Holy Spirit to help us. So we talked about how the Word of God and the voice of the Holy Spirit work together. They never work against each other because the Holy Spirit will never contradict the written Word. And if we ever think God is saying something to us that contradicts Scripture, it's not God. Amen. <laughs> and it, it's our standard, it's our authority, and so we talked about that uh, last week. Now, this week, uh, my topic, my, the chapter is called Understanding How God Speaks. So one of the things that I personally believe is that God is speaking to everyone, but we're not discerning when He's speaking or how He's speaking to us. When somebody will say, and often people will say, God spoke to me, or God told me, or something like this, I think what it does is it conjures up a wrong idea for a lot of people. First thing we're thinking is, what do you mean God spoke to you? Because in our world, when I think of somebody speaking to me, I think language and I think clarity. Those are the things that I think when somebody says, God spoke to me. I want to know how God spoke to them. And so I like to take a step back and talk about how God communicates to people. When you look in Scripture, it is undeniable that God communicated with people in multiple ways. Not just one way, but many ways. So as we take a step back and consider this, we have to, in talking about hearing the voice of God, we have to believe that God's voice is seldom a voice. That's a principle that's important as we continue in this conversation. The way you and I think of voice is, is, is not the same way that we, when we say God spoke to me or when we say hearing the voice of God, uh, God speaks and may, communicates in many different ways ways that are not just our, la our language, whatever language that might be, and it's not in a voice in the way that we would uh, typically think about that. When I first gave my life to the Lord Jesus, or when I really came to know Him at 19, the first week of being a Christian, I, had, I started having vivid, detailed dreams. Now, outside of being a Christian, I, wasn't, I didn't really have dreams, and this was not a normal experience. And when I first gave my life to the Lord, it wasn't like I knew that God spoke to people in dreams. I didn't believe that. I hadn't, there was no teaching. I didn't know anything, really. Um, I just started reading the Bible, and all of a sudden, I'm having dreams. Three nights in a row, 
I was having these dreams. And not long after that, I recognized that some of what was happening in my life was directly connected to, in a literal way, the dream that I, one of the dreams that I had had. And so I just began to, you know, freak out a little bit like anybody would, where you have a dream and then it happens in real life, and what do you do with that? And so uh, it wasn't long after that where I was attending a, a church, and at this church, they didn't believe that God spoke to people in any of these ways. It was... So I talked to some folks that were around uh, my life in this particular church, and basically I was told, just read the Bible. I don't know about all that dream stuff, son, just read the Bible. So I did read the Bible, and as you read the Bible, what you notice uh, is that 255 references to dreams and visions in the Bible. So they didn't tell me to read the Bible to validate my experience. They just thought maybe all the nonsense would go away if I read the Bible. But as I read the Bible, I felt that the things were happening in my life uh, I was being affirmed that these were things that God does do. And it was amazing, and it was liberating in a, in a sense. I don't think that they were extremely happy about that, sort of not the reason they sent me there in the first place. But I started seeing that God communicated to people through dreams. Now, not every dream is from God. Surely that's not the case. Um, a lot of them just happen, and some of them are bad pizza. But God clearly in the Bible has spoken and does speak to people through dreams. It happens. And, and so that was the beginning of me learning that God communicates in different ways, ways that I'm not asking Him to communicate, ways that I'm not looking for Him to communicate. And so I've found that seldom is God's voice an actual voice. And we, de- we tend to set ourselves up with these expectations that if God's going to speak to me, it's going to be this loud, booming voice, sort of like on a sci-fi movie, I want you to do this. And so if those things don't happen, we, we don't really discuss the details of how God really speaks to us. So we're not, we're not aware of God speaking to us when he does, if it's, if it's these different and diverse ways. So it's a conversation that we, that we truly need to have. We live in a world that we're used to different forms of communication. This isn't far off for us. For example, I remember the first time that I went through uh, the drive through ATM machine at the bank and noticed the little characters under the number. Now, I don't know why that there is Braille under the numbers at a drive through ATM machine. That's concerning. <laughs> Just say la. Let that soak in for a minute. <clears throat> But there are, and it's a form of communication for those that are blind that goes under our nose every day. Now, if you're not blind, you're probably not aware of it. It doesn't matter. You just go throughout your day and you don't notice it. But it's a form of communication. And what I'm trying to say is there are many forms of communication that go under our nose all the time. We don't even notice them. And some of them are, are, you know, there's verbal and nonverbal communication. There's over 6,500 languages in the earth, of which many of them, thousands of them, um, only, only hundreds to thousands of people can even speak them. It's, it's, it's amazing. And we sort of, in the Western world, we don't really think of, of how uh, this works, but there's lots of forms of communication. There is sign language. There's Braille. Um, there is digital communication, emails and texting. There's body language. How many married people know exactly what I'm talking about or people that have children? There is body language that comes at you. Why are you saying that? I didn't say anything. It's you were saying it without saying it. You understand what I mean? <laughs> Nonverbal communication is very, very powerful. There's all kinds of communication in the world that we live in. There's coded language like Morse code or like we used the illustration last week, Baseball teams have developed a, a kind of communication, pitcher to catcher, and also the coaches are you know, doing all this kind of s- stuff, and you're supposed to know what that means so that you can play baseball effectively while not letting the other team know what you're saying to each other. It's a coded language. There's all kinds of forms of communication that we adapt to. I think families even develop weird language and communication in their families. I've, I've hung out with some of you, and I know that you... Well, you're just weird is what you are, and, and, and we're all a little bit weird. There's good weird and there's bad weird, so we're all good weird, okay? So, but anyhow, there, we all have language, we all have, different, or we all have different communication that we develop, and I think that we just need to talk about this in light of understanding that, that we live in a world that, that, that makes sense, and God has different ways of communicating And we're often missing what he's saying because we don't discern how 
he's speaking to us, even though it, right, it might be right in front of us, just like that Braille. The first way that, uh, and I'm just going to go through them. It takes me about an hour to do this conversation, and I'm going to do it in 30 minutes from here. So we're going to breeze past some stuff. You're going to miss some things. And if you've missed the previous sermons, th- there's a lot of context for which I'm already standing on. But just know I'm going to breeze past these. I'm going to do the best I can to, to do this conversation quickly. But I need you to know that there, uh, the, we're going to look at nine different ways that God communicates. The first way is obviously through the Bible. Now, I shared extensively last week about the purpose of the Scripture But I want to mention very uh, briefly the two ways that God will communicate through the Bible to you. And the first way is this. God will use the Bible to communicate with you as you study it, as you read it, as you meditate upon it. As you open the Bible, as you read it, as you study it, God will speak to you. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, we used this verse last week. It says, all scripture is inspired by God. This means God breathed. And it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. The Bible is literally God breathed. Therefore, as we read it, we can place an expectation on it that we're going to hear the voice of the Lord at some point. And what really happens is I read the Bible every day. It's a practice and a discipline that I have because it's, I believe everybody should. It's, it's, it's the book that God's given us to know Him and to know His plan. And as I read it, not every day the words jump out and speak to me loud and clear. That doesn't happen every day. But those days, I live for those days where those words jump off the page and develop little legs and feet and hands and jump into my heart. That was a really bad illustration, but I'm using it. They jump off the page and they grab your heart in some way. I use an illustration in the book where I talk about that day I was reading James chapter 1, and I think it's verse 5, where James says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, and, because God is generous. And he goes on from there. But the word generous just jumped off the page and, and developed hands, feet, and legs and, and grabbed a hold of my heart. And I begin to see God through this one word that spoke to me, that God is generous. And the difference between generous and stingy is massive. He's not holding back. He's not waiting for me to get it together. He's not wanting me to go perform and then come back with the results and then he'll bless me. It just simply says if you lack or if you need, ask because the one you're asking is generous. And to see God as generous is profound and necessary. If you're going to have a relationship with him, you've got to know who you're talking to. And it just touched me in a profound way. And I started thinking about how generous God is and how good God is and how much a generous person wants to give. They're not trying to hold back. They're looking for opportunities to give away what they have. And I started, it just, I know this about God, but it just went deep. You understand what I'm saying? The scripture will just jump off the page and speak to your heart. That's called a passage being illuminated to you or having a revelation of the scriptures. The Holy Spirit makes that alive to us. And that's one of the ways that the Lord will use the Bible to speak into our lives. The second way is God will remind us of specific verses when we need them. Now, I think that's just awesome because we don't have to trust and rely on our own memory because how many of you know that that's not always going to work out for you? (laughs) I mean, I can't remember half of anybody's name in this room, but don't tell anybody I said that. But I really, there, I can't always depend on my memory. I love scripture memorization. I think we need to commit scriptures to memory. But I, I also know that the Holy Spirit is at work to help me remember scriptures that I had read that week or that day or last week. And he'll do it in situations and circumstances where I need those passages in those moments. And Jesus, when he was walking with his disciples, he had a lot of things to say to them. And this verse that breathes hope to people like me, he said to them these words after saying a ton of things. These things, John 14, 25, these things I have spoken to you while abiding with you. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he's going to teach you all things and he's going to bring to your remembrance All that I said to you. I can just see Peter going, oh man, that's awesome because I didn't even have a notepad when you were talking. You understand? I don't remember anything. I mean, it's just awesome that the Holy Spirit works with us to to remind us 
of the things that we had read. Now, they heard Jesus say these things, so he was saying, the Holy Spirit's going to remind you of what I said to you. We have those things recorded in Scripture today, so the Holy Spirit's going to remind us of specific verses, and that's the difference that's going to be there for us. But I remember when I first, uh, the first year of my Christian life, I was down at a coffee shop, and um, the person, there was a gal that came in, we used to be friends, and the last time I had seen this gal, we were in you know, not so good of a context, if you understand. We were, I was into the, you know, doing drugs and all that kind of stuff. So the last time I had seen her, that was what we were doing. And she didn't know of my recent conversion to Christ and, and all that followed. And, but I think everybody that just sort of looked at me could tell there was a, a difference. And clearly there was a difference in my behavior and activity. And as we began to talk, I opened up very uh, clearly, uh, very boldly about what Jesus had done in my life. And she was a little overwhelmed, so, but I told her my whole testimony. And as much as I knew, I didn't really know a lot of the Bible at that moment. I, I, I was reading the Bible. I was going to church, but I didn't know a lot. And I was telling her what I knew. And she seemed a bit overwhelmed, definitely not uh, trying to be converted that moment. Now, I had sort of this expectation that if I told you my testimony about Jesus, you're going to want Jesus like I found Jesus. And that didn't always, you know, sort of, that didn't always happen. With These were very high expectations. But nonetheless, that's what I had. And so I was very frustrated because my testimony wasn't enough to change her heart or change her mind on who this Jesus was. We're walking outside. I'm feeling frustrated and inadequate, not knowing how to explain things from the Bible, But what was interesting was the last couple days I had read John 13, 14, and 15. We're walking outside, and all of a sudden, in my mind, this looming of scriptures starts rolling through my mind. And I begin to share with her out of the scriptures that I had recently read, the Holy Spirit made these scriptures available in such a way it made me look like I knew what I was talking about. It was powerful. I had no clue what was happening other than I was so grateful for the help of the Holy Spirit reminding me of these things. Now, she didn't give her life to Jesus that night. I wish that she had, but it was a few months later I learned of her giving her heart to Jesus, and I got to play a part in planting those seeds. And it was not long after that that she actually lost her life. And so aren't you grateful, friends, that the Holy Spirit of God is involved in all that we're doing, and we need to hear Him, and He reminds us of these things. And that was a powerful story in my life. The second way that the Lord will speak to us is through impressions. Now, impressions are an internal sense in which you feel, think, or know something regarding a person or a situation. God will impress something on your heart. Uh, An impression in in a physical sense is like an indent. That's sort of what it means. Uh, But an impression is kind of like a gut feeling from the Holy Spirit. That's one way I would describe it. It's not, you know, sometimes we have gut feelings that are, you know, totally us and just feelings. But the Holy Spirit will give us impressions, and the more you'll know it's Him, the more sensitive you are to His voice, the more you're in, you know, walking in a prayer life and these kinds of things. If, you, if you're not praying much and you're not growing sensitive to Him, it's, you can't trust these necessarily. But I've learned that God does speak in impressions, and uh, I can't point you to a verse that says impression. It, there's no verse in the Bible that uses the terminology of impression. We're just using that word to describe the experiences that people will have. In the scripture, the closest that I can come is Paul. The apostle Paul was, was imprisoned, and he was standing trial before multiple people uh, in the l- latter part of the book of Acts. And as that was happening, he wasn't really getting anywhere, so he was standing trial at one point, and he basically said, I appeal to Caesar. And in those days, when you appeal to Caesar, to Caesar you go. And so they sent him on a ship and shipped him off to to stand trial before Caesar. And really, God's goal was that he speak the gospel uh, to Caesar, and he ended up losing his life for that ultimately. But as he was going uh, in the voyage that he was that he was on, some interesting things happen in Acts chapter twenty seven, verse nine. I'm going to share this scripture, and then I'll I'll talk about it for a moment. Uh, it says this: When considerable time had passed, and the voyage uh, was now dangerous, since even the fast was over. Paul began to admonish them and said to them, this is the crew, men, I perceive that this voyage will certainly be with damage and great loss, not only the cargo and the ship, but also of our own lives. But the centurion was more persuaded by the pilot and the captain of the ship than by what was being said by Paul. 
So here's what happens. Uh, they've had trouble in these, there were troubled waters, and they were having difficulty, the ship was, in where they were going. And it says that Paul perceived. Now, this word perceive, we usually uh, have as a synonymous word with discern. It doesn't mean discern. This word literally means to see or to behold something, to see or to behold something. Paul, Paul said, I perceive. He was looking at the past in the troubling waters. He was looking at the weather conditions. And as he was seeing these things, he had an impression, this is my assumption, that this was what was going to happen. Great loss and even maybe the possibility of people losing their lives. This is what he spoke to them. Now, they didn't maneuver or change their plans. They continued on with their voyage. And what ended up happening is the whole ship was wrecked. So they should have listened to Paul because he was right. But this, in my opinion, is something like an impression where we're able to see things, but not just by the natural, but there's an impression on the inside of us that we are able to, to tell that something is going to happen because of what God is speaking to us on the inside. These impressions happen. One of the ways that I have impressions is I will watch people come in church and I will essentially just look at somebody in the face, and this doesn't happen all the time, but it happens, I'll look at somebody in the face and I don't know how to describe it, but I have an impression in my heart that God is at work in them in some really powerful way. I couldn't tell you what it was, I, I can't tell them what it was, but I'll just look at somebody's face and I'll be able to tell God is at work in you, he's doing something marvelous. And I used to have that happen often enough, and I would never do anything with it. Then I learned, share it with that person. It's sort of an aha moment. And I started to share it. When I would see somebody, I'd say, man, I could tell God is doing something. God is at work in your heart. I can tell that he's doing something marvelous. And that person would light up like a Christmas tree and say, you know, you're so right. I can just sense God really at work in me. There's some things that have been happening. And it was a real a powerful encouragement. I didn't really know what it was, but I was speaking to what I saw and what I was impressed, uh, what I was impressed upon by the Lord. And when you act on these impressions, you'll be amazed at how God will use you in the lives of other people in particular. It's very, very powerful. Uh, one of the other ways that God speaks to us or in, in our life is our thoughts. The Bible says that when we give our lives to Jesus, that we have the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2.16, it's up on the screen. Paul's going through some uh, conversation there with the Corinthian church. But we have the mind of Christ. Now, that doesn't mean that when you become a Christian that everything you think is God's thoughts. Our mind is being renewed uh, time and time and time again. So your mind is being renewed, and uh, not all your thoughts are from God, but, you're, you're, but the, you now have the capacity as, as having the mind of Christ. It's, it's sure that some of the thoughts that are streaming into your mind are God's thoughts. It's very, very powerful. And uh, there's an important principle to learn when it comes to our thoughts, and that is this. Not every thought that we have originates from ourselves. Not every thought we have is originated from ourselves. It's not just from our brain. There are thoughts that come from us, there are thoughts that come from God, and there are thoughts that come from the devil. And when you read the scriptures very carefully, it does share clearly that the enemy has access to not know our thoughts, but plant a thought. I don't know how that works necessarily, but that's what temptation really is when you go through it scripturally. Uh, and you can see that in the life of Judas and a couple other illustrations that I have. I will later on in the sermon called Discerning God's Voice uh, go into great detail in talking about the enemy's goal. One of the enemy's goals is to plant a thought and then get you to buy that it's your thought. He wants you to own the thoughts that he gives as, as who you are. That's one of his goals. That's how he deceives people is he works, uh, he works to... Cause us to think things that are not true. That's what he did with, with Eve. He causes them to question the voice of the Lord in their life and so on. One of the ways that this works for me is I'll just be driving, and as I drive, I, I can't even remember how many thoughts we have during a, a moment. It's crazy the amount. I, I forget what it is, but it's just a huge number of, of thoughts that go through our mind in every given minute. But as I'm driving the, you know, my car, I'll just have thoughts come into my mind. Like, I wonder how John's doing, or stuff like this will just happen about people. And I used to not think much about it, but as it began to happen, and as I've talked to other people, it's a sort of a phenomena that goes on with a lot of folks. And here's what I've learned. When you call John or whoever this thought is about, 
I mean, it's like, you know, 60, 70, 80% of the time, you will have some kind of encouraging encounter with that person over the phone or in person or whatever it might be. You will call at the right time. You will have the right thing to say in the right moment. It's very powerful because God is trying to speak to us. He'll speak into our thoughts so that we can follow up with it and encourage and bless and strengthen somebody, somebody else. That's what this is really all about in, anyways. And so the Lord does that. King David in Psalm 40 is reflecting on God, and he says these words, Many, O Lord my God, are the wonders in which you have done, and your thoughts towards us. He's reflecting on God. He says, Your thoughts towards us, there is none to compare with you. If I would declare and speak of them, they would be too numerous to count. Isn't that encouraging tonight? When you think about the way that God thinks towards us, he has kind, wonderful thoughts, too numerous to count. One thing that I like to do is when I'm praying for somebody, I ask the Lord to show me how he thinks about this person. And I use this verse in Psalms 40, chapter 40, verse 5. I know that the Lord has countless thoughts about them. I know that he knows exactly where they are. I know he knows exactly where they're going. And he loves them way more than I could ever imagine. Lord, would you show me how you think about this person? And as I ask him that, he will begin to do that, see? But it's learning to activate this by, by stepping out there. Uh, the other, another way that God speaks to us is through visions. Visions are a form of spiritual sight given by the Holy Spirit. And you see them appear a ton in, in the Bible. In the Old Testament, uh, some prophets were actually called seers. And they, would, they were people that would behold visions. It, the Bible would say, let's go to the seer. <laughs> that he'll see some vision and share it with us. That's w- sort of what happened. Not everybody would have visions in the Old Testament. You, in many ways, had to be a prophet or it, would, it was somewhat of an exception for somebody to have one. But in the, in the coming of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church, this is what Peter said to describe what was going on. Acts 2 verse 17, and it shall be in the last days, God says that I will pour forth of my spirit on all mankind not just priests, prophets, and kings, and not just Jews, but also Gentiles. He says, your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. Even on my bondservants, men and women, I will in those days pour forth of my spirit. He mentions visions and he mentions dreams. These are things that are going to happen to common people as they experience the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Here's some things I want to mention about visions, and that is this. The first is that visions can be literal, and they can be symbolic. I could be looking at somebody and the Lord can, can show me a vision in my heart about somebody. It could be very literal. Show me a thing about their life as I, as I see it. It could be very symbolic. In the scriptures, we see a lot of symbolic visions. It, uh, there's a picture that represents something else. The scripture has a lot of symbolism in it, and you'll find that to be true. The other thing about visions is that there are things, what I call an internal vision, where you see it as you close in your eyes and it's in your heart and in your, in your mind. Uh, you'll see a vision, and that's very, very common for most people. The other kind of vision is an open vision. Those are also scriptural. You'll find those in 1 Kings chapter 6, or I'm sorry, 2 Kings chapter 6. Elisha actually prays that his servant Gehazi's eyes are opened, and when his eyes are opened, he sees the chariots of fire and angels and crazy stuff that would be really an awesome Wednesday if we were to see that. (laughs) But uh, that's less common. It's, It's rare for that to happen, but it does happen. And I want to point out a few things. Number one is that um, for some reason, and we could probably identify why, but the Western world uh, doesn't have as much of this, and the rest of the world does. And I think it's because we have a lot of skepticism in our country. If I can't see it, taste it, touch it, smell it, it's not real. We live by a reality that we can, we can perceive in the natural. And I just want to say to you that there is a supernatural, our God is supernatural. I mean... Everything about God is supernatural. He made this world that we can see, this world that we occupy. He's a supernatural God. He, Jesus, when he came, walked on water. He defied natural order. He does things outside of our box. And it's important that we cultivate a heart, not to be strange, but to have a heart that's open to more than we can see. More than we know to be true because I can, I can touch it and that's real to me. There's a lot more real beyond what we can see and beyond what we know. It's very important that we don't reduce God down to our level, that we let him bring us up to his. Didn't he say that? My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways, says the Lord. 
He's not trying to be reduced down. He's trying to get us up. That's the whole thing about walking with him. And when we talk about visions, I just want to say, if you're not used to this or this hasn't happened to you, I can tell you this from experience. There's young people all over this this United States, God is pouring out his spirit and they are seeing visions. And the last thing that they need is, is, a, is a skeptical church to put down their experiences. What they need is they need help and guidance by the word of God and by experienced practitioners, spiritual practitioners, I like using that word, that can walk them through their experiences to help them discern what's God and what's not. My experience was when I came into understanding that God communicated was Get, get all that nonsense out of your head and just read the Bible. But then when I read the, would re, read the Bible and you'd see visions and dreams referenced 255 times, there's a little bit of a conflict that happens. You follow me? It's a conflict. Because the Bible is showing these experiences and many people are saying they're not true, they're not valid. Friends, people all over the world are experiencing God. And we should want to experience God. Not to make things up or to, to, you know, to be odd. I, I kind of say this. There, there are two kinds of people. There are people that are like awed by God. They're just in the glory of the Lord. Like they are awed by his presence and his power. And then there are people that are just odd. <laughs> you know? And I don't want to be odd, but I, I want to be odd so much. He's so bigger. He's so much greater. And he does so much more than my box can fit him in. But that doesn't make me strange. That makes me a biblical Christian actually. But we want to be practitioners, people that live it, not just believe it happened someday in the distant past. Amen. Uh, I have visions happen fairly regularly. Uh, I, it's one of the ways God communicates with me. It's, 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 uh, it's really awesome. I just so appreciate this because a lot of us are visual. It used to be a word-based society many years ago. We used to read books. I think it's really... Yeah, you do. And, but a lot of folks, it's hard for, I've noticed when writing a book, it's hard to get people to even read the book a lot of the times. No offense to some of you that are in here that have been here for a few weeks, but it's hard to get people to read books sometimes. We're living in more of a visual-based society. That's just a fact that, that uh, whether it's good or bad, that's a, we could talk about that. But what, what you know is, is that with video games and television and this, that, and the other, we used to read books and use our imagination a whole lot more. And I think we're just being overdosed with entertainment. This is Ben's opinion. I think we're being overdosed and overstimulated with, with so much visual that when it comes to spirituality, I think we're just brain dead quite frankly. We're just too full. And we don't use our imagination at all. It's almost like uh, we stomp that right out of children in in a way. I'm sort of getting on a tangent that I didn't mean to. (laughs) To be continued though. Amen? (laughs) Amen. Visions. I remember one time I was at a church um, meeting, actually was not in a church, it was in uh, another location. And I was, uh, I had the microphone, so apparently I was the leader and, uh, but I was looking at, I was looking at someone and as I looked at them, I had a, I had a vision in my heart and I saw them, I saw them like as an x-ray and I saw their body, which was a little uh, frightening kind of. And I'm looking at this guy and I see like all of his bones and everything internally. And I saw parts of his spine that were flaming red. Everything was like gray, like an x-ray, but flaming red. Just there were part, and they were contorted. And I'm not a chiropractor or a doctor or anything close to that or under, even understand that. But I just knew this is not right. And not only that, but it's red. So there's a problem. And as I'm looking at him, I know that I, I just perceive that this is a back issue. Something with his back is out of alignment and, and probably severely damaged. So as, I, as the worship closed, I had the microphone, and I said, Sir, as I'm looking at you, I'm seeing you like an x-ray, and I feel that the Lord's showing me all the way down your spine. There's three places on your spine that are severely damaged, and I believe that the Lord's showing me that because He wants to heal you. I don't make promises and guarantees or things like that to get into trouble, but I just believe I'm going to step into that faith because I wouldn't see that except that the Lord wanted to do something. So I could just tell as I began to share that the Lord was already visibly doing it. Three people around him went, oh my gosh. I mean, and you know that's a good day when people around are affirming there's something really wrong with him. Well, apparently something was very, very wrong with him. Surgeries and all kinds of stuff that I'd never, I'd never even been to this 
place before or didn't know anybody there minus the person that I was with. So I shared this, and as I began to share it, this word began to come, and this word was, and the Lord's going to strengthen your back, not just physically, but also spiritually. He's going to give you a steel of spine and cause you to be able to say things that you've uh, had a hard time saying, speaking the truth. From now on, today, he's going to strengthen you, and I quoted Ephesians 6.10, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. He's going to make you strong. And I just saw myself spiritually grab a hold of his spine and just shake it once, and he just stood up straight like this. It was incredible. I can't hardly help you understand it more than that, but it was powerful, and he, he, he about you know, went to the ground, and it was an incredible experience that all started from the Lord giving me a vision of this person on an x-ray. And I haven't followed up to get doctor's uh, verifications of him being healed because I'm not trying to post it on my website and tell you how amazing I am. But I'm using it as an illustration that there was a, it was a powerful encounter. It was a very accurate word, and it all came from God opening my eyes and seeing a vision. And this is just a supernatural God that we're following. He's just showing us things. All we need to do is ask Him. Vision is awesome. The next thing that he does is he also gives dreams. And there's a lot of psychology and books behind dreams that I have no clue. I don't understand them. Uh, I don't read them either. But I do know that God speaks to people in dreams. From Genesis chapter 20 all the way through, God uses dreams to speak to people. <clears throat> now, I'm not a dreamer. I don't get a lot of dreams. But when I have dreams that are from God, they're very significant. I had a dream about me being on staff at this church 10 years before it happened. And I can show you the journal entry. I can show you the date on the journal entry. It's in my office. And I didn't share that with anybody, minus my wife. I shared it with her because I just wanted her to weigh it with me and pray whether or not it was true. But I just went on with my real estate career. I shared that with you a few weeks ago. But God caused it to be. And, and I've, I don't think I've shared it except for um, in the last few weeks. But this, the, the Lord gives dreams. He gives me directional dreams. There's three categories of dreams scripturally. There's maybe a few more. But I've learned that there are directional dreams. God will give, sometimes he'll give you a dream uh, about direction, where you're to go, what you're to do. He'll give correctional dreams. He wants to correct something, cause, a, a, cause some alignment to happen. And then the third thing that he wants to do is he wants to give prophetic dreams, which is what I had. He'll show something that's going to happen before it happens. Now, those are all very scriptural, and I could, I could prove that to you if I had the time, but I won't have the time tonight. That's why this takes an hour for me to do this. But God spoke to people through dreams, Joseph, Jacob, Solomon, Daniel. How many of you know the story of Solomon? When Solomon received his wisdom and his knowledge, did you know that was in a dream? Did any of you realize that? That God appears to Solomon in a dream and says, what do you want of me? And Solomon says, give me wisdom to lead your people. And he says, because you ask for wisdom, I will also give you riches and wealth beyond measure. That was in a dream that he received that. It's powerful. It's powerful. Sometimes we forget that the fact that that actually was a dream. That wasn't even a personal encounter. That was a dream that the Lord gave. And so dreams are one of the ways. And I just want to say this about dreams, sort of some cautionary things. Uh, sometimes people get carried away with dreams. Like Christians have dreams that are like novels. They're just really long. And we're trying to like there was green and this was red and this was blue. You know, we're not omen interpreters. It's not a, you know, God isn't trying to confuse people. He, I'm, how many of you are simple? I am simple. When God gives me a dream, typically it has some simplicity to it. And whenever I get out of the box and I start going, well, the green meant this and this meant that, and I start doing all that stuff, something's a little off. God will give a dream and all I look for in the dream is the simple pieces of the dream. The last thing he wants us to do is get distracted by 15 years later trying to figure out what this dream still means. If you don't understand what it means, put it on the shelf. Just keep following Jesus and pursuing his kingdom. Amen. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about because we're not trying to get distracted by some cosmic puzzle that God is so desperately waiting for us to figure out. There's simplicity to these things. Look for the simple pieces in the dream. And uh, I'm sort of a target for people wanting me to interpret dreams. I have no idea why. <laughs> Maybe because I teach hearing God. It's not true. Maybe I do know why. But half the time, I, you know, Joseph said when he was asked to interpret Pharaoh's dream, this is what Joseph said. He said, interpretation belongs to God. 
If you don't know what something means, the first thing we always do in anything that's symbolic is say, God, what does this mean? And wait in prayer. And if he says nothing, you say nothing. Just keep going. That's how I do that. And I've had dreams, and, and I don't understand things all the way. And God is a good father, isn't he? Yeah. You know what I like about the Lord? There are sometimes the Lord begins to speak to me about something, and I can't tell you 100% of it's God, but I, I know he's trying to communicate. He is communicating to me. And I'll just be honest, like sometimes I don't get it. Sometimes I really don't get it. And I know this is offensive to some people when I share it, but I remember, uh, I just think he's such a good dad. There are times where God's showing something to me and I just say, next. <laughs> I remember one time I was sitting down with my oldest son and I'm trying to help him understand balancing a checkbook and budgeting. And as I'm doing that, I'm just working this thing. I'm sort of financial guy. I'm, I'm analy analytical and all that. And I'm just working this thing. And I'm, I'm, I'm already coming up with a plan of how he's going to know when he spent money because he needs sort of a, uh, you know, young people need a little bit of a starter plan. They can't just jump into the plan that I'm using. And so I'm trying to develop this really, uh, I think, user-friendly plan. And as I'm going through this whole thing and writing all this stuff out, I look up at him. I go, do you get this? And no joke, he looks at me and just goes... It was one of those, like, yes, no, maybe so. And as a dad, I look at him and I just go, I crumple up the paper, I throw it, I go, let's I step aside. We're going to try a different method, you know. And, and God's like that. Friends, what God will do when he's speaking to us is there are times where I don't get it. And I talk to him like a son and I, I understand how this works. I'm like, God, I don't get what's going on. Can you just, can we just move on to something else? Because I'm not going to try to figure this out. Just help me, Lord. And he'll, he'll do that. He'll do that just like uh, I am with my son. And then another way that the Lord speaks to us is an internal voice. I don't use the term still small voice because in 1 Kings 19, when Elijah hears the voice of the Lord, the still small voice, it's an audible voice. So when we say still small voice, we usually mean an internal voice. But the voice in 1 Kings 19 wasn't it wasn't internal, it was audible. So I don't like to use that terminology. I like to say what we mean and mean what we say. So I can't show you a scripture uh, that God spoke in an internal way necessarily, but the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. So it makes good sense in my mind that the Holy Spirit, as he's guiding us into all truth, as he's speaking to our hearts, that he is saying a lot of things internally. And the way that this works is he, will, he doesn't dialogue with me. Dot, 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 dot. Oh, dot, 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 dot. Dot, 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 dot. I don't have that with the Lord at all, ever. It never happens with me like that. What does happen, though, is he'll give me phrases. And it'll be like this. Ben, I want you to read Psalm 91. I want you to go and talk to that person. This is what I want you to do when you get up tomorrow. It's very clear. It's a phrase. It's a word. That's how the internal voice of God is. It's very from him to me. It's not like my thought that could be mistaken as myself. It is very clearly from him. And these happen. I was in a house one time, and I was, uh, this family was serving me food before I went to go speak somewhere, and this word kept coming to my mind, Brazil, Brazil, Brazil. By the fourth time, I'm like, I think I need to do something with this word. So I just said, does anything about Brazil mean anything to you? And I remember the guy just sort of pushed back from the table and said, we're actually in a process for the last two years of trying to adopt a child from Brazil. And we're almost, trying, we're almost giving up on it because it's not happening. Now, that is all that I had was Brazil. But there was nothing in their house that looked like Brazil or anything like that. It just was Brazil, Brazil, Brazil. And I share it, and it just one word breathed hope into this family to pursue and to continue the process that they had begun. One word from God, doesn't matter how it comes, is worth more than anything else in all the world. Is that true? One word from God can change somebody's life. It really can. And the internal voice of God is really powerful. This morning, before the first service, by the way, this is the third service. <sighs> Don't feel my pain. It's all right. You have your own to deal with. But uh, I enjoy this. I'm just messing with you. 
this morning before the first service, I shut my door in my office, and I had about 10 minutes, and I just spent it in prayer. I said, Lord, what do you, what do you, what do you want to say to me? And no joke, nothing, he said nothing for about seven, 10 minutes, however long it was. He said nothing. I just prayed and petitioned. As I'm leaving my office, I heard this. There's somebody in the first service that has difficulties with their daughter. It's going on right now, basically, is what, it's very clear. So I wrote that down, and basically, I was going to say that in the first service, that I was in prayer, and this is what I feel like is some, something's happening with somebody, and you know what? I forgot to say it. Isn't that crazy? I was just, I wanted to smash myself. So I'm out there, and I'm talking in the foyer with a few people, and as I'm on my way out the door talking to the last person, it's already, I don't remember what time, I'm going to go into the office and come back for the second service. There was somebody that, that just sat down in the seats, and I could tell that they were waiting for me. And they walk up, and, uh, and I know who they are. I've seen them before, and I've talked to them. I didn't remember both of their names anyways, but I do know them to some degree. And they walked up, and they began to talk to me, and they were sharing about their daughter and the difficulties that they're having and ask for prayer. And I just, my eyes sort of tear up and I go, I know this is crazy, but I, before I came into the service, the only thing that I felt like I heard God say was somebody in the first service is having difficulties with their daughter. He didn't even tell me what to do about it. He just said this to me. And she, the gal began to cry and I said, I, I believe I'm supposed to talk with her. I believe I'm supposed to, con- I need to connect with her or something. And so we're looking into having that happen. But aren't you glad that the Lord speaks to his people and encourages us, us as parents, us as spouses, us as young people, that he's encouraging us, not just leaving us to figure this out. It's awesome. It was awesome. It's what they needed as parents. They needed to know that that the Lord was putting it on somebody else's heart that had no no connection necessarily to, to this situation. I'm just going to blow past these real quick because I'm already a little over time, but the audible voice of God is another way. I've never heard the audible voice of God. I, in the book, I tell you a story. My friend, when he was 18 years old, he was going to commit suicide, and he goes out to commit suicide, basically, and he hears a voice speak behind him saying, why don't you give me a try? <laughs> it's just loud. <laughs> he turns around. Nobody's there. He ends up sitting on the bank of, of that lake that was mountain water, freezing water, gives his life to the Lord through this series of things. Heard a voice. Why don't you give me a try? Didn't kill himself. And it's awesome. He, he, he later became a pastor and, and told me the story. I wrote it in the book. It was profound. And this is a guy that just wouldn't say, you know, God spoke to me audibly and it's, it, you couldn't trust it. This is a guy that truly was honest about the situation. It happens. God speaks audibly to people. In the New Testament, the Father speaks over the Son. Other people hear. He says, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. When the Father sees the Son, he speaks of his pleasure. And we see that in the New Testament, that there's audible. Another way that God speaks is through angels. Angels are are messengers. Literally, the word angel can mean messenger. And there's all over the world, there's activity, angelic activity going on all over the world. And I know to us and in, in our ears, uh, sometimes in the West, that seems strange, but God dispatches his angels to bring messages to people for, the, for his purposes. They are messengers, and he, he utilizes them for his, for his kingdom. And um, I, I, I don't like to talk about this because, you know, people will think you're crazy, but angels, by the way, are not Gerber babies in diapers. <laughs> They're massive, fearless creatures that stand before the presence of the Lord. It's not something we should take lightly, but there's angelic activity all, all around us all the time. We just don't see it. But I believe that angelic activity is going on all the time. Matter of fact, Hebrews 13 says, entertain strangers, and some having doing so, or it talks about practice hospitality to strangers, some having done so have entertained angels unaware. Try those shoes on. That's awesome. Practice hospitality. Some having done so have entertained angels unaware. Angels are among us. Really is going on. And and some of my close friends, including myself, have experienced this. But the point is the message um, because that's what we're trying to to get to. to. Uh, And the final one is God speaks through other people. 
He causes us to hear him through teaching of the Bible through other people. He causes us to hear him through wise counsel. He causes us to hear him through prophetic words that other people will share with us. I want to close with this. If John, if you're here, could you come and uh, wherever John is, if he's not here, that's fine. But uh, I want to close with this. The question is, why does God speak to us in all of these different ways? And here's my first answer. I have no idea. That's a great answer most of the time. I really don't. Uh, but I, I do know that this is the way that it is. I really wish that I could do- dial up 1-800-HEAVEN and go, you know, what, what about this and get an answer. I, I, that would be awesome. Clarity is a gift, it's something I say regularly. Clarity is a gift. But it's not that way. God often will speak in, in other ways to us. And so it's, it's important to understand this. I asked the Lord this question, Lord, why do you speak in all these different ways? And here's the answer that I got. I had a vision um, momentarily after asking that question. And this was the vision. The vision was I saw a hand with several different seeds in the hand and then a garden similar to what I have at home. And in this garden, I saw the hand, not the person, but the hand, uh, begin to plant these different seeds. And immediately, the seeds became strawberries and carrots and, you know, different things. They just grew up <clears throat> immediately. Different seeds, different fruit. And all of a sudden, as I'm watching this happen, it was in response to the question, why do you speak in different ways? I just realized that different seeds produce different kinds of fruit. But all are important and, and all are wanted. And I realized that God will plant his word, different kinds of communication into our heart for different reasons to produce a different kind of fruit. Does that make sense? It just dawned on me that God does that. If he gives you a vision, it has a certain emphasis and a certain impact. If he causes a, a scripture to be re- remembered, it has a different emphasis, a different urgency, and a different impact. These different ways, all un- under, you know, all within the parameters of Scripture, not contradicting to Scripture, but within that, the Holy Spirit is planting seeds, causing fruitfulness in our life. He knows what He needs to say to us, but He also knows how He needs to say it, because some communication will carry with it a very specific impact that He's trying to bring in our life. <music>